you for inviting me. So I will start with, uh, so it's, it's already quite late time, so I will s probably will tell some fairy tales. <laughs> And with one thing, the other thing is that actually everything will be very much concrete in this talk. So, so much concrete that you can put it just on the computer and calculate everything. I will start with some uh, actually quite old story. It's uh, originated from previous century and the introduction. So it's called a groupoid of upper triangular matrices and I will try to explain why it's so interesting why it's so interesting to consider namely this stuff well because it also contains many hidden uh, gems inside it so but first I will uh, start with the definition of algebraic groupoid So, uh, it's uh, schemes of objects A and morphisms. M that satisfy, uh, that have several uh, maps. So, we have a source map as that uh, maps from M to A, the target map also from morphisms to, uh, to the scheme of objects, and there are some several other maps, identity, and most important, uh, multiplication. We don't require the existence of co-multiplication. Sometimes it exists, sometimes not. So it depends actually on the situation. But in principle, we have this set of maps. And also we have a special uh, maps, special two projections, natural projections P1 and P2. that uh, then comes from uh, a target and source map. So we come back to, uh, come down to A, where P1 and P2 some uh, natural projections. <coughs> and uh, it's, a, it's a general. So now we specify it to this groupoid, so uh, the space of morphisms is just uh, given by uh, pairs of matrices where B is just a matrix and we say that A belongs to a class A where A is a set of upper triangular matrices, unipotent. So we can explicitly think about it as a matrices with units on diagonal, zeros below, and some uh, terms A, I, J above. <coughs> And now we specify this, all these maps. So, uh, but first of all, we need to say something. So we need to add here that, well, A in A and the combination B, so A, B, T is again in this set. So, so this action on the space of forms preserve the property of uh, upper, uh, upper triangularity of the, of the result of the action. And then we have just a set, so the source map from the pair BA is just A itself, the target map 
from the pair from the morphism is the result of this morphism and uh, identity map is also will need it so it just matrix a goes to identity a because obviously this pair always belong to morphism set and finally multiplication is defined for uh, two morphisms so we have b a b t and that's why we call it a groupoid because obviously it's defined not on all pairs but only on those for which uh, uh, basically we have here the result of the uh, target map of the first morphism uh, and the result is obviously uh, the morphism that is a composition of these two so what is known what uh, it's uh, you know that the this action admits a natural symplectic structure consistent with this so it's probably i will probably mention a bundle paper of 2000 but also you can see some references inside this paper so it's uh, probably Alexei was not the very first person to consider it because the general theory uh, so we have a symplectic form uh, on morphine space and this symplectic form must satisfy a very special the very special splitting condition splitting condition with respect to these two uh, natural projections so we have that In physical terms, this means that the results of the, the source and target maps, they post on compute, actually. So, so, this, uh, so this symplectic form splits into subspaces of source and target maps. It's very strong condition, and it's not that easy to satisfy it. So it's, but basically, again, I should mention some names. So possibly the very, very first was uh, Karasov. But then the theory of these transformations and these morphemes were, cons uh, were developed by uh, Weinstein, Philip Bolch, and actually some other people like M Kirill McKenzie and so on. So I don't want to uh, go into many details in this part just to mention that this is very restrictive condition and actually it's so restrictive that basically it almost makes the corresponding uh, symplectic structure unique but one thing that we can immediately uh, mention is that the identity map itself define a Lagrange submanifold so this means that simultaneously we can oops, we can define the corresponding algebra on the set on the uh, set of objects and we have a unique Poisson structure that is compatible correspondingly with this uh, action of morphisms and this structure turned out to be a very famous structure known again even before uh, all this appears 
in mathematical literature on the physical side of the story. So the corresponding symplectic structure, I will uh, write it in uh, again in uh, notations of the products of um, direct product of spaces. So it is what is in the physics uh, an integrable theory is called uh, reflection equation. I will write it right immediately in R matrix form. Oops. And basically, it's not that difficult to write it in terms of uh, eigenvalues of this matrix, or eigenvalues, sorry, of just uh, entries of this matrix. Uh, but I try to avoid writing it in this way also because it was written also by myself so many times before. But it's just that we have, you see, from this consider uh, from this formula we have a it seems like it's quadratic algebra if we also uh, remember this restriction that diagonal elements are units then it's quadratic linear algebra in terms of uh, matrix entries of a so where r is again uh, just to say again if we write it in the uh, notation of product of spaces we can write it this way so if it if were not this factor it will be just permutation matrix uh, this theta factor is just a function that is one when x is positive one half when it's zero and zero otherwise and so you see well those of you who ha have some experience with this expression, you see that it's just uh, what is called a trigonometric R matrix, or just half of permutation matrix. Just immediate, uh, immediate remark is that all these structures have a quantum counterpart. So we can also quantize this and actually from the in terms of writing it's even better because quantum R matrix relations are much shorter than classical one. So we have uh, in terms of quantization so we just translate the corresponding brackets into commuta commu uh, commutation operators and the quantization of this relation has this famous form that is even you can find it on the cover page of say Molef book I will not so I will write once this uh, Q parameters and then I will probably stop writing it. So, and this is so where again. So, if you ask me what is this T1, it's partial partial transposition. So, it's transposition with respect just to the first uh, space. So. It's just E J I. Why it was uh, why it is so interesting? Because well, we know again for many years that if we identify and it identify these matrix entries with the geodesic functions on a special set of geodesics on um, Poincaré hyperbolic upper half plane 
uh, on uh, Riemann surf, sorry, on the Riemann surface obtained by a quotient under the Fuchsian group from the hyperbolic space. So then and impose impose the quantum skin relations. And let me abusively write it in geometrical term. Also, of course, it's pertained to the corresponding algebraic terms. It's correspond to the cor corresponding algebraic functions co uh, that uh, correspond to geodetics that has a crossing. So recall that quantum skin relation has this form. <coughs> so we have two resolutions of this crossing and we add them with uh, different coefficients, different q, q coefficients, again very close to the counting of probably Jones polynomial or Alexander polynomial, depending on interpretation. I don't want probably to mention that, but what I do mention is that if we impose this quantum skin relation, then this gij satisfies the same algebra. So the quantum algebra of quantum geodesic functions is the same as this uh, algebra for now quantum uh, groupoid of upper triangular matrices. And in quantum case, the only uh, the only uh, changes that I have to make is to replace these units by again Q factors and so on and assume that A, I, J are self-adjoint, self-adjoint operators. Well, it was nice. It's, it's even um, uh, nicer because in this case, for these uh, quantum geodesic functions, we have a very special and very explicit representation. Again, it probably was mentioned several times here. But let me mention it again. So if we have, because it will be in the core of my talk, so if we consider Riemann surface uh, of genus G with S holes as a quotient of hyperbolic upper half plane under the action of the corresponding Fuchsian group, then uh, the corresponding Teichmüller space admits description in terms of shear coordinates. Uh, that I will use exponentiated notations in my today's talk, so they have. I will take Z alpha, and then we know that there is a combinator, uh, uh, combinatorial description of these spaces by, well, Fock, I would say, mostly by Fock. 97 that's actually claim that every for air every uh, Riemann surface of this uh, in this model every geodesic function not only this special geodesic function but any geodesic function they are Laurent polynomials with positive coefficients of of this exponentiated shear coordinates and possible with q factors if we consider quantum case so uh, when we don't know exactly exact uh, uh, quantum ordering then we have to add these q factors into play this was nice but uh, there was one unpleasant thing and 
and well but before i so the other pleasant thing about this there was a, that there was existing the cluster structure that actually uh, governs this corresponding shear coordinates so uh, one thing that was bothering me like well Sergei Guk mentioned that <laughs> he was bothering with 15 years with his problem my problem is smaller and uh, probably I was the only person who was bothering with that one nevertheless uh, one observation that we have so for these structures if we have a matrix n times n we have to take Riemann surface of genus integer part n by 2 and s is 1 or 2 depending on the correspond on the parity of the corresponding uh, of the corresponding answer and basically uh, the dimension Poisson dimension real dimension of of Teichmuller space is 6g minus 6 plus uh, so if I interested in Poisson dimension then it's 2s <coughs> and Poisson dimension of this space of this matrix of size n is So it's this is the number of uh, of uh, entries and this is the number of uh, Casimirs for the general Poisson leaf. So if we consider and if we take this and consider the corresponding dimensions for three, four, let's say five, six then it's it's match for three it's match for four it's match for five even but then of course well one increase quadratically another linearly so there is no way that they will match this means that these geometric representations they are only Poisson leaves or symplectic leaves and actually of very small dimension for large n and the first problem that was torturing me do we have any <coughs> in physics way derbu or log canonical <coughs> coordinate representation for general Second interesting uh, observation about the same structure is that is about the same morphism is that there are very special morphisms in this set, namely those that relate to a braid group action. So if we are still in the introduction. on this set of uh, a n matrices and braid group action yes it indeed exists so we say that it's b i i plus one i immediately write it you you know in quantum in quantum case so it maps a to apparently it has all it's always have this form that it's Maybe I will just, uh, well, I will just change slightly. It doesn't matter, so it's where I put uh, transposition. Where this B matrix, well, it has some very, exa uh, very explicit structure. So it's, it's unit matrix anywhere except the two by two block when it has this form it's or better let me stick to a
And then again, it's we have a bunch of units. So it's uh, not, well, it's just explicit calculation. You can check that actually this action is indeed the braid group action, and even it satisfies the condition that if we apply all the chain of transformations, we get a permutation matrix. <coughs> so, and therefore, again, Provided, provided we have this Darbu coordinate representation for a general uh, s for a general uh, matrix, uh, and we suppose that it's also related to clusters, cluster algebras, then the second question, second problem. is describes to describe this braid group action <coughs> via cluster mutations. And surprise, surprise, today I provide answers to both these questions. And for this, well, as usual, if it was 15 years ago and we were trying, that's apparently this means that we probably didn't try in the proper place. So, uh, because if you will dig it in some other place, probably it's not six feet under, but maybe just one or half a feet under. And it actually happens. So, solution. Solution turns out, so remember that we identified entries of matrices with some uh, traces, with some characters of SL2. So let's just try something even simpler than that. <coughs> let's consider instead of uh, uh, Teichmuir spaces, which are related to character varieties of SL2, Let's consider now higher touch mirror spaces. Consider uh, introduced by Falk and Goncharov. And let us see how it will work in, in this particular situation. So I need several, again, several definitions. So this is already not the introduction. It's a meaningful part. So n again, we start nevertheless with the Riemann surface uh, of, re of genus G, S is the number of holes, and P uh, we usually use n, but we use n for something different. So p is a number of, uh, we call it bordered cusps, but for me uh, they will be just uh, the same as marked points on boundaries. And the first and the main example of uh, this structure will be just, just a triangle. So when we have one hole and three marked points. So in, uh, in just normal uh, situation, it's just an, Id an ideal triangle itself. But now we have this uh, nice structure by Fock and Goncharov, so we actually, I I will not again explain everything, but just recall that we have a set of three complete flags in in this uh, vector space, in vector space of dimension n. And 
we can define using four goncher of coordinate wo coordinates what we call a transport matrix again it's now I describe it in details so uh, that's where I need I need this picture that I preserved uh, that I made beforehand so we end this picture is specific for GL5 so what we have we have is called a planner uh, cyclic network uh, so we have a set of uh, uh, so so don't pay attention first to black part just pay attention to these blue arrows and the corresponding vertices so it each corresponding vertex we have the variable so for instance here I have zero so if it's five then it's five here and then I enumerate them correspondingly so I, I enumerate them the i j k where i plus j plus k is equal to the corresponding number n and uh, so this will be uh, one for zero and this one this be zero for one and so on so just enumerate them somehow I don't and then define the following structure define this transport matrix let's def let's uh, I'll use the same notation but it's not no no I don't want MIJ no notation must be different because it's not the same so MIJ by definition is a sum overall passes and passes are calculated uh, actually now passes are calculated in dual graph so we take all and you see that uh, the passes must be uh, consistent with arrows so we're going only along arrows never back that's what we and there is no cycle that's what we call a cyclic network so we have the sum of passes and then we have the product of all variables alpha so uh, I also use the notation alpha to denote all this bunch of numbers <coughs> so for all alpha that lies above this path by some reason we have to choose the direction above this path a i j e z alpha and well this was known so this is this was a representation that was actually uh, I think it appeared first in Bernstein <coughs> Famine and Zelewinski even before invention of cluster algebra so it's a paper of 98 and also these now blue arrows the blue arrows include commutation relations or Poisson relations between these z so we have that z alpha z beta is actually equal to uh, how we write it so it's it's plus minus one or plus minus one half depending on where we have this blue arrow from alpha to beta or back 
and one half actually correspond to this dashed arrow. So you see that uh, some of these arrows are dashed. It's not my mistake. It's how it works. So if we have this relation, and if we also have uh, So it's not from it's not in this paper. It's but we can. Uh, that's now the next statement that I want to uh, I want to formulate as a theorem. that if we have this the corresponding while ordering so this means that I just take the exponential of in physical terms also of course these uh, elements they do not commute but we write them in this way if so if it if we assume this while ordering then the transport transport matrix M satisfies the quantum R matrix relations. What is interesting in this relation is that actually it's a ma it's a the matrix M is quadrat is not quadratic is is rectangular because I have actually this matrix is a matrix of size n well it's a, or let's say two n times n because I have n sources and two n things on two sides because you see this black arrow they go outside from two sides and I have input only from one side and correspondingly these R matrices quantum R matrices have different size actually I skip I skip uh, I skip some part but I just present the result because the proof is very easy the proof is just very local it's based on gluing this all this huge network out of elementary transformations and we can check that for every elementary transformation as uh, a corresponding condition is satisfied which means that well that's this is the advantage of our matrices that we can if if this relation satisfy for one ma uh, for two matrices, then they will be automatically satisfied for their product. So we can just construct it out of elementary operations. For every elementary operation, I it works. So basically, we have even more general theorem. So if V again recall that it's all in seal. In, in still unpublished paper with Misha Shapiro and we have a more general <coughs> theorem that for every directed <coughs> icyclic network plane melt one more condition that it's plain plain graph
this uh, and sources and inputs and and outputs we have the corresponding relation we have that uh, our Now let's see a corollary of that. What if we restrict to this particular network, or actually if any network with m equal to m, any network that, any planar network that has a, uh, where the number of things tw is twice the number of sources. Because then we have the corresponding matrix is, well, it's uh, n or 2n, it's always varies in my talk. It consists of two quadratic matrices of size n by n. And the, cor the simple corollary of this relation is that for these matrices, we have the following set of relations uh, for we have just the standard Lee Poisson or Poisson Lee action on the terms on each for e every matrix where I is one two and we have this interesting relation with which consists uh, which contain just one R matrix for the relation for the commutation relations between these two uh, uh, these two matrices and uh, and this is still for any planar networks for for any with uh, just with this restriction of, of sizes then we have uh, we have to uh, make some adjustment so if we uh, consider specifically for Goncharov network for Goncharov quiver then we need some adjustment we need to um, make some uh, small transformations of these matrices m1 and uh, m2 for instance uh, we have to introduce a special central element delta i will not write uh, the specific expression for the uh, for it because we don't have much time but just to mention that if we take uh, qs m1 And if we take M2, uh, basically the same, so where M1 and M2, so M1 is a, uh, is a transport matrix from this side to that side, M2 is transport matrix from that side to, to that side, and S is anti-diagonal matrix of this form for uh, for uh, for uh, for uh, uh, for uh, gl5 it it will be like that uh, q is just diagonal matrix of q and minus i and deltas are <coughs> some elements that we actually we use these elements to turn from gln to sln so we have actually we remove this 
variables the corresponding cluster will variables at the angles of this diagram using this normalization then the claim is that uh, they satisfy these relations so uh, Uh, with some adjustment of our matrix, with uh, quantum R matrix goes to Q minus 1 N R N Q. This is the first condition and second most important for me is that if we now consider the transport matrix uh, along uh, from this side of triangle to that side then these three matrices satisfy groupoid condition groupoid relation so the composition quant in quantum case the composition of these moves produce the move from this side to that side so this provides us uh, so with the consistency condition for transport matrices so this means that now we can define it in the product of triangles not just in the single triangle but we may consider and one more thing is of course by construction by this product then we can claim that uh, the elements of mij they belong actually minus one i plus one so up to this uh, common factor, they are still positive uh, Laurent polynomials with positive coefficients. Do I want to save that? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Also, I need it, but so now if we have a triangulation, We can define the transport matrices in the set of these triangles in the following way. So we first we require that P is uh, greater or equal one. So I need at least one uh, one boundary, or well, how Ralph and Bob call it, window on the corresponding surface so we start with this window and then we have a uh, this transport matrices coming along this triangles and coming to another window or to the same window so in print uh, we, we don't have any restriction it can be any any pass in the corresponding triangulation in the corresponding graph and then we say that the transport matrix of the pass of any pass in quantum case is just the matrix product of these elementary moves it's either one or two uh, and it uh, we go we just uh, go through tr uh, thro through different triangles so it's alpha n so if you enumerate them uh, in between we between two matrices, two transport matrices, we introduce the uh, absolute value of S, where we just have an anti-diagonal matrix with no with no signs, with all signs positive, and so on. And 
And just from these conditions, so we also impose the condition that uh, variables in different triangles Poisson or quantum commute. But we also impose so because by this construction we have on the boundaries we have an um, amalgamation <coughs> amalgamation of border elements because they for instance if I have uh, if there are sources here, there are things on the previous triangle, and we have just to consider the product in the obtained quiver. Then, in, in this explicit construction, we immediately obtain two results. The first one is that this product is invariant under quantum mapping class group. What is the uh, quantum mapping class group? Well, it's uh, basically it's a uh, sequence of, of quantum cluster mutations that correspond to this flip. Ptolemy? Uh, in, in SL2 it's Ptolemy, but in general it just a, it's just a sequence of cluster mutations. So for instance, well, it was, it was in Fog Goncharov, and for this uh, and it was also recently considered by uh, uh, Schrader and uh, Shapiro, but different, uh, Alexander Shapiro. So they just show that if we have the same, the same while ordering, then uh, this while ordering is preserved. So if we have the while ordering, then, and, and we just use it to define this, uh, uh, the corresponding transport transport matrix along the path, then it's preserved. For instance, it's easy to check that what is really easy to check, just two lines, if we have, for instance, here two transport matrices that correspond, one correspond to this and another to this path, then we can just using only using these R matrix relations, we can prove that they commute. And this is consistent with this. So if we make this transformation, then they become disjoint in these triangles. Second semi-classical result is that thus defined transport matrices satisfy semi-classical Goldman bracket. So if they if they cross here, then again, so the semi-classical Goldman bracket correspond to, uh, is can be written in this way. So it's if we have the Poisson relation between these two, it's minus 1 over n for SLN. Let me remove this. It's minus 1 over n. Uh, the same crossing uh, plus, plus this resolution of this crossing, if we have a direction. So we have to fix the direction. But it's only semi-classical. If we consider pure quantum relations, we cannot uh, split this into this quantum skin relation, unfortunately. Yeah, 
Yes, over and under crossing just indicate the order in this case. Which one <coughs> is on the left and which one on the right. And in the output probably there is a sign, I agree. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. What is more important now, finally, finally, and the last main result is that define that theorem. Define A, matrix A, to be just this combination of these two matrices for this actually it's not even for this cure it's for it's for any planar network claim that this a satisfies quantum reflection equation that we have here so this immediately provides us, so because it's just the product of matrix element, each matrix element is in this class. So basically all these elements of this matrix actually belong to, for this particular network, to Z plus of of this uh, skin, uh, of this uh, whatever, cluster variables or extended uh, shear coordinates or whatever. So we have a, so this is a solution of the first problem. We have a Darbu coordinate representation. What is the corresponding quiver? This is an interesting question. So actually we take this quiver and this amalgamation due to this transposition works in the following way. First, it happens that we have a new set of uh, of, uh, of Casimirs that allows us to eliminate this part completely. <coughs> and then we have to amalgamate and amalgamation is this crosswise. So for instance, this element is uh, uh, amalgamated with that, this one uh, with the uh, corresponding with this, this with that, and this with that. So, uh, and different colors indicate actually, uh, so elements of the same color comes into the product that defines the corresponding Casimir. So product of all green elements is one Casimir, product of all red elements with, res uh, with the counting of this amalgamation is second Casimir. And now you can have a look at the opposite side where I presented the quivers for the first four cases. <coughs> And you can spot that they are very much symmetric. So this actually, this action, this amalgamation produce very symmetric graphs. And again, in this part with the same color, I indicated uh, elements that, uh, are, uh, that are central. Okay, so I almost, I depleted my time. Last and the very last mention is that we also were able to solve the second problem. So we know actually the sequence of cluster mutations in these quivers that produce a braid group action. So for instance, I indicated with numbers, so with one to three. So if we first mutated one, then at two, then at three, then at two and at one, so it's just one, two, three, two, one. It's one sequence of cluster mutations that actually preserves the form of this quiver. You can check it. And when you take the one, two, four, two, one, uh, this is the inverse transformation. 
and we have we, there is a sim uh, there is a more symmetric form of writing it i just don't want to i just say uh, just indicate that we have a solution also to the second problem so uh, i i'm almost done so i have to stop and definitely one thing one thing the last thing to mention that i believe that there are many many more applications of this of this story with regarding uh, probably not invariance as regarding maybe lagrangian knots also because i believe that this transposition is not just out of blue it's just uh, related to what is called in modern literature lagrangian knots when we invert the direction but this is part so this is definitely i believe some part of beginning of some other long story so let me stop here Yes. Quantum cluster algebra. Yes, yes. So for instance, in the Conway algebra, that's the Conway algebra n equals three there, right? For n equals three, yes. Even for n, for n equal four is still geometric. So what is the? I mean, what is what is the braid group? What is the braid group? And uh, what is its action? It's uh, but the, the braid group. If we come back here, it's uh, it just uh, can be picked up from here. So basically, it's. Uh, from <laughs> from the formula that I uh, removed. So I in terms of this, well, uh, yeah, that was another thing. So, so you're you're looking at a kind of quantum A uh, upper unit. Yes, yes, yes. Is, is it is it, is it, uh, is it the, the usual Q algebra, this Fadeo-Fraschetikin algebra, or is it the Fraschetikin? It's not. No, no, no. It's not. Fad it's. I don't think it's Fadeo-Fraschetikin actually. Actually, in geometrical case, it's just the. Uh, quantum mapping class group transformation when we do a quantum dent twist. Uh, Can you write, write, write down what the Q relations are for the Yes, yeah, we can. Uh, there are explicit formulas for... In, t in terms of this matrix elements, it's just um, very explicit. It's uh, not nothing, uh, so n nothing mysterious. It just, uh, again, so this, uh, these are quant quantum dent twists that were considered by uh, Fock and myself and by Renat Kashaev, so uh, we know the spectrum, we know more or less we know everything about uh, their action. What is of course uh, interesting, what is relevant to this story is to consider uh, special quantum uh, representations at roots of unity where uh, they are finite. And there we have a finite uh, representation of this braid group action. So this is, it's not a, uh, it might be the same exactly as uh, to Rife and Reshetichin. It might be slightly different on or even simpler because we don't have a uh, product of spaces. We, we just have one space where we act by this braid group. And is it like to be a theory of mirror or Reshetichin to Rain? That's a good question, Jorgen. I cannot answer. I have to check it with the literature but uh, but definitely it's just obvious that it's some uh, next direction of research because again it's very fresh everything more than <coughs> less than one year old yes well uh, i have one question one so me you, you said that so you have some positivity result right yes so you do you know that if that counts something that's the usual question right yes does it count anything? Uh, does it count uh, something in geometrical case? Here it's very easy. No, well, for instance, it's very easy. It's one example that I uh, that I s wanted to present, just didn't have time. So, if, for instance, let's set all that equal to one, just consider number. So then, for instance, for this M matrix, we have. just sorry sorry for wasting time but so for instance if I consider m1 
it uh, for for three by three it's like that for four by four it's sorry one three three one minus one minus two minus one zero one one zero zero minus one zero zero so pattern is obvious it's just binomial coefficients <coughs> and then amazingly enough uh, you see it's uh, so it's not obvious but if i take a square of this matrix it's not a full dimension but it's exactly m2 and m2 is very similar it's just well i will write it for this case only for not wasting much time And if we have now the product, the proposed product, so if we have, ah, then we have, and this is three, of course, this is uh, this uh, triple polynomial for geodesic function. And it's uh, one, four, six, one, four, one for one in four case and again you easily spot that it's again binomial coefficients so basically for this there is no mystery just uh, any uh, any element is a binomial coefficient and it just count how many monomials we have in the corresponding in the corresponding mat uh, in the corresponding term it might be no 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 we'll uh, we'll discuss it with Leosha of course exactly so I mean I don't know so but he is in different domains now so it was for him, it was story that uh, probably uh, <laughs> remains in past. <laughs> Oh, of course, so here it's just easy, so because again, so just element of the braid group here, it's it's again, it's one, one minus one, zero. If we, if we set all these elements equal one. So. Uh, again, so uh, yeah, so so the, so that's that's how they were constructed. If I uh, okay, so it might be not one. So it might be the first uh, the first uh, element above the diagonal. So it's n m. <laughs> So for n by n case, it might it's probably have this form, each every element of the braid group. Okay. Well, if there are more questions, maybe. Yes. Yeah, so uh, okay.